During the first half of the Hundred Years' War, France suffered a series of humiliating defeats. The English army, led by talented commanders and with numerous archery units, seemed invincible. By the end of 1428, the English and Burgundians had occupied almost all northern France. It was only necessary to take control of the valley of the River Loire and the invader opened the way to the central parts of the country. The English managed to take almost all the important fortifications and Orleans, the last major city on the river, had been under siege since October 1428. At this difficult moment when it seemed that nothing could inspire stunned by a series of defeats of soldiers. In the bloody chaos of war, broke into the dazzling star that changed everything. Joan of Arc appeared on the scene. In early March 1429, she arrived in Chinon and joined the army heading to the aid of Orleans. Here, the French warriors, struck by the bravery of a 16-year-old girl, won a victory forcing the English to lift the siege. Then followed a dizzying succession of victories. Wherever there appeared this young miracle dubbed Orlean Maiden, the French army gained the upper hand. In just a few weeks, the English lost several fortresses in the Loire Valley. To stop the French offensive and help the besieged fortresses, the English sent a detachment of five to 6,000 soldiers under the command of John Talbot. But men sur loire and Beaugency fell before the main forces arrived. After taking the fortresses, the French army of about 5,000 men advanced to meet the enemy. Near the town of Patay, a battle took place that became a turning point in the Centennial War the English army command, having learnt of the surrender of the fortresses and the advance of the French army, turned its troops around and headed in the opposite direction, deciding to fight on more favourable terrain. As had often been the case in previous battles, most of the English army was made up of archers. John Talbot decided to use a tactic that had allowed the English to win victories for many years. He was going to occupy a dominant height, entrench himself on it, and allow the French to attack. A tactic that invariably led to victories even over numerically superior opponents, as was the case at Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt. Not far from the town of Pate, John Talbot found a suitable hill on which he ordered defensive positions to be prepared. The French army was commanded by the Constable de Richemont, the Duke of Alençon, and Marshal de Brosse. On the advice of Joan of Arc, who constantly demanded to speed up the movement, it was decided to leave the infantry behind to continue the pursuit with only a mounted detachment, which numbered 2,500 riders. As usual, in front at some distance from the main forces, moved vanguard under the command of Lahir, about 180 riders. The French had no reliable information about the location of the English, but they guessed that the enemy was somewhere nearby. The horsemen moved cautiously forward, trying not to make noise. The road that led to the bridge on both sides surrounded by dense forest. It was the perfect place for an ambush. The men-at-arms were tensely looking into the thicket. It seemed that someone's attentive eyes were watching intently from behind the trees. Suddenly there was an unusual cry in the thicket, accompanied by the crunch of broken twigs, and a large deer jumped out onto the road. With huge leaps, the animal returned to the forest and rushed towards the river. The unexpected meeting allowed tension to relieve a little. The riders smilingly recollected cases of hunting, bragging about the trophies they had got. Suddenly, there were shouts in English ahead, and a deer ran out into the road again, accompanied by laughter and hooting. 
The archers sitting in ambush had no idea that the French would move at such speed and that the enemy's vanguard was only a hundred meters away. Many of the archers made their living by hunting, and now, seeing a fine trophy in front of them, could not contain their delighted shouts. The commander of the vanguard La Hire instantly assessed the situation, rightly deciding that surprise could compensate for the small number of troops he ordered the warriors to attack immediately. Splitting into two parts, the vanguard rushed at the enemy. With a deafening crackle of low shrubbery, the cavalry rushed at the enemy. Stunned by the sudden attack, the archers were unable to resist and scattered in panic. Normally, any infantry would be able to fight against cavalry in difficult terrain, especially in the forest. However, in this case, the attack was so unexpected that the archers did not have time to orientate themselves and panicked. Having defeated the archers, La Hire ordered the vanguard to move on without delay. The warriors, elated by their easy victory, crossed the bridge and encountered the English army in position on the hill. Lahir noticed that the enemy had not had time to prepare for battle. Despite the twenty-fold superiority of the enemy, the vanguard commander ordered an attack. The horsemen rushed at the enemy without delay. The English, surprised by such impudence, were confused. Troops did not arrange their positions. The soldiers did not have time to stick stakes in the ground, dig holes or trenches in front of the positions. The unprotected archers without cover were afraid to face the cavalry and after firing a few indiscriminate volleys, they fled. The French quickly caught up with the enemy and began to mercilessly cut down the fugitives. Some of the English men-at-arms also gave in to panic and turned to flight. The horsemen pursued the enemy without giving it a chance to recollect. The cavalry bypassed the islands of resistance without engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat and crashed into the ranks of fleeing sowing chaos and panic. Soon, to the battlefield approached the main forces of the French. A powerful ramming blow mass of mounted men-at-arms swept off the hill remnants of the English and completed the defeat. Victory at Pataille allowed the French to establish control over the Valley of the Loire and turned the tide of the war. The English army suffered catastrophic losses. At least about 2,500 men were killed, wounded and captured. The French lost only 100 soldiers. The English could not recover from such a defeat and were forced to go on the defensive, giving the initiative to the enemy. In fact, the war was reduced to a series of sieges in which the French one after another captured the fortresses held by the English. <laughs>